Salbona by Cheryl Martin. Salbona, that's the Zulu word for hello, which literally translates as I see you, and by seeing you, I bring you into being. Five foot five, roughly, was five foot three for ages, not in any way skinny, not terribly big for me, brown eyes. They fill with blood when I'm angry, borderline rage. Hardly happens these days, hardly. Very long locks, dreadlocks. Go down to my ass, but I wear them piled on top of my head to hide my ginormous fall patch. I wear glittery slides in my hair and you know, stardust Alice bands, crystal flowers, tiaras. My skin in this wet country is normally lighter than a paper bag, but when it gets the sun, two weeks on a hot beach, it goes the most glorious deep golden brown. I love my skin most then, as if sunlight were alive, could move and breathe. I grew up in the 60s, and I believe them, the Panthers, with their afros tilted just so, when they said, black is beautiful. I love the skin I'm in, and I wear bright, bright colors, parakeet green, bird of paradise blue, or rainbow sequins that fall clear to the floor. I'm a visible minority, and I make sure everyone sees me. I have to hold my head high, so all the younger ones who look like me will see. Nobody can tell just by looking who I fuck. That doesn't matter. The days when lesbians had to have short hair and wear Doc Martens are over. I like dresses best and Birkenstocks, whatever. Nobody can see the scars on my wrists. Either. Not anymore. Faded after 40 years. These days, if I want to self harm, all I have to do is eat chocolate. Diabetic. No one can hear the chaos still inside my head sometimes. No one is there when I wake up every hour on the hour, night after night all night long, week after week. I can't remember ever sleeping the whole night through. That never, that never, that never, that's never. No one can see that. Only 61 and no wrinkles, just sun-kissed skin. My mother's cheekbones and my grandmother's, half indigenous my mother's mother, Nobody can see that either. Politics, I'm a visible minority with a hidden disability. My poor parents, it must have been hard on them having a child like me. Cuckoo in the nest. I didn't want them to be unhappy, to always worry. So I learned to hide everything that's most important. I learned how to cry without making a sound, still can't, until it's too late. And I start crying on buses, in taxis, in shops, until the tears won't stop. But most of the time, no one can see unless I help. I have to help people see who people like me really are. Make sure they understand that whatever they think, a 61-year-old, disabled, overweight, black, balding, diabetic lesbian looks like, they'll know she looks just like me. So for me, disability and the politics of disability are all about the choice to be seen. No one can tell just by looking at me that I'm a lifelong suicidal depressive with borderline personality disorder, or that it took 40 years of therapy to make those tears stop, or that even with all that, 
and antidepressants and ongoing therapy online since the pandemic. I still find it hard to sleep. Totally true. I never sleep the night through. And in the performing arts, particularly in theater, lately, well-being is becoming something of a buzzword. The notion that employers and venues have a duty of care to their staff and their collaborators is taking hold, finally. But there is still a fear among performers admitting to mental health issues will harm their careers, that people will be afraid to book them, that if you put in an access rider, a stipulation in your contract, that you'll be given the right to reschedule should your mental health require it, employers will run scared and deny you work. And I remember a few Edinburgh French festivals ago, everyone was saying that this was the year when mental health took center stage. So I went to some of those shows. It was mostly people talking about how hard it was for them to live with someone who had mental health issues. Not the person with the illness performing, but their children or their spouses, talking about how difficult someone else's illness made things for them. And that's valid. I, I'm sure it was hard. My father was an alcoholic to the day he died, and that did create quite a few problems for the rest of the family. But there were very few of us talking about what it means, how it feels to be us. Nothing about us without us. That's a war cry I believe in. So I felt it was incumbent upon me to do shows about what it feels like to grow up suicidal, to try to commit suicide, to survive, to go on being suicidal. What it feels like to live the utter inner chaos of being borderline, to get audiences to walk around inside my mind. We are swans, borderlines. When I was at Union Estates, I remember once someone told me I was the most calm and serene person they had ever seen. I think I had just been in the campus hospital the day before, and I know I was wearing long sleeves to hide the bandages on my wrists. Calm and serene on the outside, screaming and flailing in the vortex inside. I have felt in my solo theater work that I had to tell the truth about what it feels like to be me because I could never do it any other way. I started hiding when I was so young that I never learned how to tell anyone what was really going on outside of therapy. When I did tell the truth, there was always at least one person in the audience, just like me, who had never been able to see themselves anywhere. When I was growing up, I thought there was no one like me in this world. I can be the one now to show people that they are not alone and that it doesn't have to go on forever. For me, I think the worst is over. 50 years later and 40 years of therapy, but I'm still here. And my future is different, open, not perfect, but free, free from constant depression, not blissful, but quite often happy, more happy than not. And I want others to know that that is a possibility. <laughs>